Good morning and welcome to our online Good Friday service. The Friday before Easter uh, has traditionally been a day of reflection on the sacrifice of Jesus 2,000 years ago. So we're going to have several readings from the New Testament Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they will be read for us by members of our church. Before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you loved the world so much that you gave your only Son to suffer and to die in our place, so that all who believe in him would not perish but receive everlasting life. Please help us now as we hear about the crucifixion of your Son. May we be those who are humbled by his sacrifice and receive its benefits with thanksgiving. And may we be helped as we see what it looks like to faithfully suffer. Please be with us all now in the name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. The Bible's account of Jesus' betrayal and arrest is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 39 to 53. Luke, chapter 22, verse 39. And he, that is Jesus, came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, please remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. The Bible's account of Jesus' trial before the Jews, Jewish religious leaders is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 57, through to chapter 27, verse 2. Matthew chapter 26 verse 57 Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders had gathered and Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and going inside he sat with the guards to see the end Now the chief priests and the old council seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death but they found none though many false witnesses came forward at last two came forward and said this man said I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days and the high priest stood up and said 
Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the, by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said you also were with Jesus the Galilean but he denied it before them before them all saying I do not know what you mean and when he went out to the entrance another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders this man was with Jesus of Nazareth and again he denied it with an oath I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are, you are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to evoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. The Bible's account of Jesus' trial before the Roman governor Pilate is found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 15 verse 2 to 23 mark chapter 15 verse 2 and pilate asked him are you the king of the jews and he answered him you have said so and the chief priests accused him of many things and pilate again asked him have you no answer to make see how many charges they bring against you but jesus made no further answer so that pilate was amazed now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner from whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had, whom had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again asked them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified and the soldiers led him away inside the palace that is the governor's headquarters and they called together the whole battalion and they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns they put it on him and they began to salute him hail the king of the Jews and they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. 
The Bible's account of Jesus' crucifixion, death and burial is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 35 to 61. Matthew, chapter 27, verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desire him if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer today. We come and we acknowledge you to be the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who spoke and this world came into being. We acknowledge, O oh God, that you are the one that gives life and breath to every creature. Therefore it is our duty and our privilege to praise and to worship you, our great God. We thank you, O oh God, that you have reminded us in your word that though you are far above us in every way, we thank you, O oh God, that you are not far from any one of us. We thank you, O oh God, that we can pray and you have promised to hear our prayers. And so as we come humbly 
before you now, then we pray, O oh God, that you would hear us as we pray to you. We thank you, O oh God, for this Good Friday, and we thank you for all that it reminds us of, that Jesus Christ suffered and died upon a cross. Father God, we acknowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ was innocent of all the crimes that men accused him of. We thank you, O God, that he is the perfect, sinless Son of God. And yet we thank you, O God, this morning that he was willing to be made sin for us, that he took our sin upon himself. Your word tells us that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to be punished for the sin that we have done. And we thank you, Lord God, for the salvation that Jesus Christ has won for those who will repent of sin and trust in him. We thank you, Lord God, today that sin and death are a defeated enemy. We thank you, O oh God, that as we heard last Sunday, we were reminded that the curtain, the temple, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. We thank you, O oh God, that that barrier that separated man from God has been removed. We thank you, O oh God, that as your believing people, we can have fellowship with you, our great creator God. We can call you our Father in heaven, that we are now your children. We thank you, Lord God, for the inner joy and peace and contentment that we have through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for the joy and the peace and the comfort that we can have and which the world cannot take away. We thank you, O oh God, that even in these days of uncertainty and trouble, of difficulty, and for some deep sorrow, that we thank you, O oh God, for the comfort the joy, the peace that the Lord Jesus Christ can bring to our hearts. So we pray, O oh God, that on this Good Friday, as we again hear the message of the cross, we pray, O oh God, that you would speak into each of our hearts. As we meet in our homes, in different locations as we are separated from one another we thank you O oh God that we can nonetheless still have fellowship with you we thank you O oh God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus so we thank you, O oh God, that because of the cross that you are with us today. And Father, again, we do just ask that as we hear that message once again, that Father God, you would speak into all of our hearts. Father God, you know our hearts, you know the condition of our hearts. And Father God, we do pray that you would be gracious to each one of us now that as James preaches from your word, that Father God, not only would you bless and help him, but you would bless and help us too. That Father God, we might be those who turn from our sin, that we might be those who would put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, 
who is the only saviour from sin, the only one who can save us from the judgment that you will bring upon this world. And so Father God we do ask that you would be with us and that you would bless us now and we ask it all in Jesus name. Amen. Here we are in the middle of an international health crisis where many people are suffering. Maybe you are suffering. And you might be asking the question, why? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Well, the Bible has a few answers to that important question. One of the main answers it gives is that the world is full of suffering because it is under a curse. Humans rebelled against their creator, and as a result, all of creation is under a curse. The natural world is groaning and longing for the day of liberation when it will be set free from the curse. The coronavirus is part of that curse. And the suffering we experience is as well. All suffering falls into three categories. Physical, emotional, and spiritual. There's physical suffering in our bodily pain. There is emotional suffering as relationships with other people are broken. And people experience things like depression and shame. There is spiritual suffering, as our sin separates us from God, and we wander the earth looking to the things of creation to satisfy us, rather than being satisfied by the one we were made for. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus came to overcome the curse, to overcome all of our suffering. And the way he did it is by taking the curse upon himself, intensely suffering under God's judgment as our sinless substitute. He was cursed so that all those who by grace receive the gift of salvation would be blessed. And it is amazing that the most vivid description of the cursing of God's Son is found not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. That part of the Bible written before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In Psalm 22, King David opens a window on the suffering of Jesus during those three agonizing hours of darkness on the cross. Jesus, the Son of God, who became a man in order to become a curse for us, suffered in every way as deeply as anyone could possibly suffer. There is no facet of misery that Jesus didn't experience on the cross. So please open your Bibles to Psalm 22, and we are going to be looking at the first 21 verses. Psalm 22. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. 
They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Amen. This is God's life-giving word. May he help us now as we consider it together. Like I said, all suffering falls into three categories. Physical, emotional, and spiritual. And here in Psalm 22, the depth of Jesus' suffering is vividly described for us. This is the most intense suffering ever experienced. It is totally unique in its intensity because Jesus is God in the flesh. This three-hour experience accomplished salvation for people to the ends of the earth and for every generation. So let's consider each kind of suffering, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Firstly, Jesus suffered physically. His enemies are physically persecuting him with such brutality that they are described as animals. They are portrayed as bulls, lions, and dogs in their savagery. They murderously close in on their lonely victim. And the singer portrays these people as animals in order to convey what they are like. They are the powerful ones who resist authority and greedily consume everything at the expense of the weak. They are vicious and they love violent spectacle. And yet amazingly, these are the type of lost people that Jesus came to seek and save. We are to look at this scripture like a mirror and see the darkened sinfulness of our own hearts. It's uncomfortable to realize that that we are part of this crowd surrounding the cross. We partook in this greatest sin. We are responsible as Jesus bore our sin and took the curse. For us. God did not send his son because we are so valuable, but rather because our offense was so infinitely horrible that only the substitution of the sinless son of God could remove it. We like to think we aren't that bad, that our sin isn't that offensive. But the Bible tells us the truth. And it shows us our great need of a savior. And this psalm shows us the extent he was willing to go in order to save us. Verses 14 to 18 is a vivid description of the execution of a criminal by crucifixion. Written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented. He describes himself as having bones out of joint, 
when somebody is crucified, their, their hands and their arms and their shoulders and their pelvis all come out of joint. He describes himself as perspiring profusely as he is poured out like water. He describes his heart melting like wax and formless. His strength is exhausted like a broken piece of pottery. He experiences extreme thirst, tongue sticking to the roof of his mouth. He is naked as his garments are gambled for, and most vividly, he describes his hands and his feet pierced through. He can no longer function as a human being. He is broken. He is no longer able to cope. He is desperate, a condemned criminal, pierced and broken, naked and dying. God's Son, the source of life, came to suffer physically and die. Secondly, Jesus suffered emotionally. In verse 6, the greatest person to have ever lived feels less than human. He says, I am a worm and not a man. What irony. Jesus is God in the flesh, the great I am. And now he says, I am a worm. Why does he feel this way? The answer is given in verse 6. He is scorned and despised. Verse 7. He is mocked by those he came to save. He has become a source of entertainment for these people as they stare and gloat over him. Verse 17. Now, this would have been the most extreme humiliation and shame imaginable in this culture. He receives no compassion as he is rejected and brought low. This is the worst kind of emotional suffering. When people ridicule you, especially when it is those who know you and you love. What condescension our Savior experienced. He is the eternal divine Son, the creator and king over all things, worshipped in heaven by legions of angels. And yet, he became a man. The creator became a creature and was despised. The Lord of light came to experience emotional darkness. So he understands the depths of our emotional suffering, of your emotional suffering. When we feel less than human, when we are unable to function, he suffered physically. He suffered emotionally. Thirdly, Jesus suffered spiritually. The psalm begins with the worst kind of suffering, spiritual anguish and separation. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He feels isolated and cut off from his father, the one with whom he enjoyed eternal fellowship and joy. Now he hangs suspended between heaven and earth, isolated from his father. He is distressed and perplexed because his prayers for help go unanswered. He feels this intense alienation and abandonment. We know this verse so well because Jesus quotes it after he has hung on the cross for three agonizing hours in which a deep darkness covered the land. God was silent as he watched his beloved son bear the sins of his people and become a curse on the cross. This is the moment of the greatest and most intense spiritual anguish. Jesus' suffering was so complete that it is impossible for words to convey how horrible it was. This psalm shows us that on the cross, he was at his breaking point, spiritually abandoned by God, emotionally feeling less than human as he suffered at the hands of his people, physically tortured as a condemned criminal. 
He is desperate. He cries out to God in this prayer as he is on the threshold of death. Condemned in our place, pierced for our transgressions in order to save us. What amazing grace. Now that we have considered our Lord's suffering, I want to spend a few final minutes thinking about how this is to affect us in our day-to-day lives. The good news of Jesus' death on the cross in our place has ripple effects that reach to the ends of the earth, that come down through the generations and meet us today. I want us to consider two ways we should respond to the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death in our place. We should be humbled and we should be helped. Firstly, the good news of Jesus' death should humble us. Our Lord voluntarily experienced infinite suffering so that we could be saved. He came to do something that we could never do, accomplish a great salvation on our behalf. And this salvation is to be received by faith. We are to stop thinking that we can somehow pay God back for our sins and wrongdoings. We are to be humbled and trust in the Savior's life, death, and resurrection. Have you received this good news? Have you received Jesus, the suffering Savior? Have you trusted in what he did for you? Have you been forgiven? Have you been blessed through his sacrifice? Has he taken your sins and the judgment they deserve? If so, if you are a Christian believer, do you continue to run to Jesus for ongoing forgiveness and cleansing? He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you today. Have you been humble? Secondly, the good news of Jesus' death should help us. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus' sufferings allow him to sympathize with us. He understands what we are going through, and he is eager and ready to help us in our time of need. He knows what you have to go through today, tomorrow. The next day. He sees you and he wants to help you follow his example. What did he do during his suffering? How did he deal with it? And most importantly, how did he endure it? Well, throughout Psalm 22, he focuses attention on God, reflecting on who God is and what God has done. In verse 3, he sings about who God is, yet you are holy. God is holy, which means that he is perfect. He always remains faithful to who he is. He has complete integrity, and he always does what is right. He is holy. The psalmist follows that with a description of God as king, enthroned on the praises of Israel. He is the king who always does what is right. It is interesting that this description of God is usually the last thing we think of when we are suffering. But God wants us to believe these twin truths about himself. He is good and he is in control. Make these truths part of your prayers in the coming weeks, especially when suffering comes to your door. Talk about these two essential truths about God with family and neighbors 
and friends and co-workers. Think deeply about them. Let them sustain your hungry and weary soul in the midst of hardship. When you suffer, remember God is holy and God is in control. In addition to receiving help from focusing on who God is, the sufferer rehearses what God has done in history. Verses 4 and 5. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. History has shown that God can be trusted. He has always been faithful to his word and his promises. And I hope you are the blessed person of Psalm 1 who delights in God's word in the Bible day and night. Open your Bible. Read it each day so that you can respond to suffering by knowing all of the many examples of God being faithful to his people. He is for you. Even when it doesn't look like it. Even when it doesn't feel like it. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Because he rescued those people in past generations when they trusted God and cried out to him. But be careful not to expect things to be done on your terms, according to your wishes. God may have other plans, plans that seem strange to us, including deep and lasting suffering and even death. But he promises to be with you through the valleys of deep darkness. He promises to ultimately rescue you. He did it in past generations. He will do it for you. The psalmist can also recount God's faithfulness in his own life. In verses 9 and 10, he describes from the earliest age God's intimate involvement in his life, giving him faith, keeping him trusting, faithfully caring for him. God is no casual acquaintance, but a lifelong friend and father. Have you known God to be near you in the past? Has God shown you compassion through earlier seasons of hardship? What about your personal testimony? How did God rescue you out of the darkness of sin and judgment and bring you into his kingdom of light and life? Remembrance is a powerful help in hardship. God is willing and able to help you in your suffering. He sent his son to suffer and die in your place so that, among other things, he can sympathize with you. And he left you an example of how to suffer faithfully by reflecting on who God is and what God has done. The final help we receive from our Savior's example here is to note that Psalm 22 is a prayer. He is speaking to God about his suffering. This is so obvious, yet it is essential for our endurance. We are helped by God when we cry out to him in our suffering. We are nourished as we talk to him about how we're feeling. Remember, prayer is an expression of faith. We are demonstrating, as we pray, that we trust God and we ask him for help. He calls us to prayerfully remember and reflect on his words and works. As we do that, it strengthens our confidence in him, and that is the very thing that causes us to endure. I hope that in this psalm, you find great help and hope. Jesus has accomplished a great salvation through his suffering. So firstly, be humbled. Trust in this great Savior's perfect sacrifice 
and find God's mercy and forgiveness through his blood shed for you. Secondly, be helped. Draw on the strength to endure through remembrance of God's past and present faithfulness. And can I just say, as we head into Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, that you read the rest of Psalm 22. You see, the Savior's suffering isn't the end of the story. No, he is pierced and mocked and laid in the dust of death, but there is so much more. God remains faithful to save him from death, raising him to the heights of heaven, to be praised by people from every nation, to be the king of heaven and earth, and to offer us help today in our sufferings. He offers us hope that there is an end to suffering. There is a glory to come. So read Psalm 22 in the coming days and marvel at our great Savior, Jesus Christ. And now let us finish with some words from the Apostle Peter. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.